Welcome everyone to another episode of the Damage Report. I am John Errol, very excited on this gigantic show, State of the Union show here at the Damage Report to welcome back to the studio, Emma Vigeland oh, is here. Thank you for having me and audience, it's John's birthday. He won't tell you, it but is. I will. <laughs> well, thank you. Yes. And um, I guess my present from the network is to have an awesome co-host. So thank you for being here. Oh. Um, people have been asking me how I'm gonna spend my birthday, what I wanna do. And I can't think of anything I wanna do more than listen to Trump talk for like an hour. Uh, but then Bernie talk, but also Stacey Abrams. So it kind of exactly. evens out, right? It evens out to some yeah. extent. Um, if I could delete the entire thing, I would. And I thought that we'd gotten past it actually. I thought that we wouldn't have one. In any event, we are gonna be doing a little breakdown of some of our expectations for the State of the Union, as well as some of the individuals that will be brought as symbols for various sides to sort of drive some discussion around the State of the Union. We're gonna have that. We're also gonna have updates on a number of different important topics, including the family separation crisis, the absolutely insane immoral arguments being made by the Trump administration for why they shouldn't even bother cleaning up their mess when it comes to that, as well as updates on the upcoming Green New Deal bill from Representative Ocasio-Cortez that we can expect in the very near future. Along the way, we've also got two awesome guests who are gonna be joining us. And effectively, the theme with those guests and otherwise is going to be income inequality, wealth inequality, economic dignity. We've got a, a nice uh, hearty helping of that for you today. And if there's time, we're gonna be closing out the show with the first time that I think Emma has been involved with uh, a meanwhile in. Hmm. So we're gonna be taking a tour of uh, news from across the world and through time itself, actually. So it should be a lot of fun. I'm excited, I hope I remain in one piece. Okay, well we will see. During we're, time travel. <laughs> we're gonna try to make sure that that happens. Um, before we jump into the news, just wanna mention, if you are not already following The Damage Report on Facebook, you can do that at facebook.com slash The Damage Report TYT. It is a great place to find our clips if you happen to miss a show as well as articles that we think our audience would enjoy reading, would learn something from, interesting infographics, photos, and all of that stuff. That's, so that's facebook.com slash the damage report TYT. And with that, we launch into the news. Tonight is the state of the union, so hold on to your butts. It's gonna be <laughs> something. And look, I wanna talk a little bit about what Donald Trump is likely to say or do. I think noises are gonna come out of his head and they're gonna have some sort of effect. But I'm also interested in, who he and some of the Democrats are choosing to bring to the State of the Union. So we're gonna have that as well. First, it's happening tonight. We know that he's apparently going to make a call for increased bipartisanship, which is a laugh. Hilarious. Coming from him, <laughs> as well as some sort of plan to fight global HIV infections. That, absent the details, sounds good. What else do you expect to hear from him? Out of his mouth hole, probably MS-13, MS-13. I mean, what's the over under on how many times he says MS-13? 14 or so. Yeah, okay, I guess. we should take running bets while we're doing the coverage uh, tomorrow night. But yeah, I think, <laughs> or tonight, excuse me. I think that he's going to be talking about immigration constantly. This is his last gasp before he can uh, get the get Congress to get on board with his wall funding, even though that went disastrously when he shut the government down. The government could close again on the 15th, mm -hmm. so he needs to make his case to the public. And that's what he's going to do by fear mongering as is evident by the guests. And then also take a stand against bullying because we all know yeah. uh, how how kind he is in his heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a, he's a protector of the bullied child. Yes. Um, yeah, look, he. I think that the single biggest focus, and he'll probably talk about a lot of different topics, but he is gonna talk about immigration a lot. As you say, we could be launching very soon within the next two weeks into another government shutdown. And right now, if you just listen to what people are saying, the Democrats are saying no money for a wall. Trump is saying there will be no deal without money for a wall. So it sounds like we're gonna have another shutdown, except that Trump has already caved on this topic. And hypothetically, the Democrats could, but I don't know why they would a couple of weeks after winning on this. So it seems like he's setting himself up for failure unless something big happens to shake the situation. Unless he decides that he's going to use or declare national emergency, which could be his way to get around it. It's absolutely absurd, but that's what he's kind of hinted out before. How likely do you think that is? I mean, I would put it at a good 30% likelihood. You never mm -hmm. know, people have actually asked me that. How are you, like, what's the likelihood of that? Maybe it was you, mm -hmm. um, and it's impossible <laughs> to predict from this guy. One day he says one thing, the other, the next day he says another. Mm -hmm. So um, 
I really do think, though, it's going to be a majority of the, the State of the Union is going to be fear-mongering. And what we have to remember is that there have been studies that have shown time and time again that immigrants who come here illegally commit crime at a far less uh, mm-hmm. rate than the rest of the population. So it's truly counterfactual and purely demonizing people that don't look like you. Yeah. Uh, and that's the sole goal of this. I don't understand why Democrats don't scream that study, which I read in the New York Times from the rooftops, because it, it just completely uh, disproves everything he's trying to say. Mm-hmm. I mean, even in his immigration address, when Bernie did his response, there were consistent fallacies and falsehoods, lies in there that were ran counter to his own Justice Department data. Yeah. So it's never about what's true. It's always about uh, you know how people feel, and that's kind of the theme of his presidency. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I guess I, I'm usually hesitant to make predictions because I'm always wrong. Um, In this case, I don't mind because if I'm wrong, it'll be good. But I think my gut is, I feel like he's gonna do it. Because not necessarily just because of what's happening right now, but because of different paths that he could take for the rest of his presidency. So he tried to stand up to Nancy Pelosi and he lost. Which was pretty shocking, I think. It was fun, yeah. And it mean, was it was fun. We don't proud of Nancy. Exactly. Yeah. We don't we don't generally say that. We don't generally get to say that. Happy about her. Exactly. And <laughs> a lot of people were saying, and not just Democrats were saying, well, this might be the end of his presidency. Not in terms of like yeah, Mueller's going to drag him off, mm-hmm. but like effectively his ability to have his agenda and make it happen. Even Lindsey Graham, like on the fourth or fifth of January, was like, if he doesn't get the money for the wall, he's effectively done as a president. So he's heard some of that. Is he ready to, to like if he does not get the, do the national emergency, if he does not get the money for the wall, he could be irrelevant. He can't abide that. Now declaring national emergency is incredibly politically risky, but he doesn't care. What does it matter if he yeah. destroys the country? He I mean, it was I risky think that's to shut option. down the government. It was risky to shut down the government, but he doesn't seem to care about that either. Yeah, um, he's a child just thrashing about, so you can't really predict everything he's going to do, which is what mm. what. But I, I think he might do it too because the Democrats won't budge a second time. If they didn't budge the first time, why pathetic. would they? But it would be pathetic. And they actually were pleasantly surprising us, as we kind of hinted to Nancy Pelosi, especially leading the way and saying we will not fund this wall, we'll mm. fund border security, et cetera, trying not to seem soft on immigration, which it's absurd to that, mm-hmm. that, that they're that concerned about that. But um, I, I truly think that he, what, what the Democrats hinged their point on was that he said Mexico was going to pay for the wall, and now he's asking the American people to pay for the wall. It's simple, people can understand that that was a lie. They can see all of those uh, clips of him saying Mexico was going to pay for it, and then asking the American people to pay for it. Mm. It's an easy political win, um, and the only way he can get around it is with the emergency funding, yeah. which uh, who knows, but yeah. I think you're right. Well, look, let's turn now to uh, some of the people that will be showing up to the State of the Union. Um, let's see, on Trump's side, he's got family members of uh, Gerald and Sharon David will attend to represent the Reno, Nevada, Nevada couple. The Davids were killed in January after police said a man suspected of being in the country illegally killed them during a robbery. So obviously a very sad story for the family. Um, Trump continues to surround himself with these families to make a point, he not did this, about the he family. He did this last but, day of the Union. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm not surprised by that. He'll continue props. to do that. I, I even like, hate that the Democrats bring these people too. But. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel terrible for them and their experience. And I don't doubt that they want to be there. They think that this is the right course to stop this situation from happening to other families. I just happen to disagree. Uh, Elvin Hernandez, a special agent with the Department of Homeland Security, investigates drugs, gangs, and human trafficking. So he will be there to represent those on the front lines against the national emergency having to do with uh, immigration. Probably a great guy. Again, being used to push this particular policy agenda. Uh, we've got some that are, seem perfectly fine. God knows what details we'll find out later. But Matthew Charles will attend as the first prisoner to be released because of the First Step Act. He was released on January 3rd after being sentenced to 35 years in prison for drug related offenses. In the press release about it, they focus a lot on him finding God in jail. Um, look, if, if the Republicans can find even one prisoner that they're okay with not being in prison anymore, that's progress. Yes, I guess. yeah. Um. Yeah. And then, of course, the sixth grader who was bullied by Trump. Yeah, Joshua Trump, who's been bullied because of his name. Joshua, like, come on, you gotta bully a Joshua. Yeah. I'm kidding, a Trump. So (laughs) 
Um, I feel bad for Joshua. I'm I'm being honest. I feel bad for him, and I hope that those who are mocking him for having the same last name as the president will stop now that he is being invited to the State of the Union by that president. Yeah, I don't, I don't think, think they know how bullying works. Happen. And Trump is the big, biggest bully in the country. <laughs> anyway, but I do feel bad for him, I don't want that. Um, now, on the other side, you do have uh, some good guests. So uh, AOC uh, released a video actually with the person that she's gonna be inviting. Let's play a portion of that. So I got us matching pins. Excellent. From oh, yeah. the Jackson Heights shop. And it says, well-behaved women rarely make history. Well-behaved women rarely make history. That's, that's right. right. <laughs> Let's so not we be can, well behaved ever. That's right. Ever. And so we can wear them on Tuesday. Awesome. So there you have, uh, that's uh, Anna Maria Arquila, uh, who, one of the activists who confronted Senator Jeff Flake back uh, during the Kavanaugh hearings. Yeah. A very powerful moment that uh, that certainly looked at the time like it might have been a turning point. Unfortunately, Jeff Flake is a little weenie. Um, but, <laughs> but the activists did a great job. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's the political clout that Ocasio-Cortez has still is unbelievable to me. She's in her a freshman congresswoman mm-hmm. and she's bringing someone to the state of the union and everyone cares about that. Yeah. You know, that's blows my mind still to this day. I really thought she was going to bring Cardi B. This probably makes more sense. I yeah, guess. it probably does, although Considering. that would be way more fun. That would be fun, but she I'm sure she'll have fun too. <laughs> uh, so uh, Jeff Merkley uh, is going to be bringing a mother and daughter who were separated at the US border. So um, again, very sad story of what happened to them. Um, glad that they're getting the focus that they are, but it is to push an agenda. Let's I, I keep don't real. Mean, I like these people. I like that agenda. I but hate that's anecdotal happening. things. Like in politics, politicians mm-hmm. always focusing on one specific case to humanize it. It, does, it has zero effectiveness to me, and this is kind of part and yeah. parcel of that. But. Yeah. Emma Viglin for dehumanizing things. <laughs> Get your people out of here. Uh, so a couple more, uh, Kirsten Gillibrand is gonna be bringing uh, Blake Dremen, a transgender Navy Lieutenant Commander who has been deployed 11 times, who obviously now, future of the career of uh, Blake Dremen as well as others, uh, might be permanently ended because Donald Trump woke up one morning and was told to attack transgender individuals. Yep. So great that we have him in, uh, in office. And uh, Elizabeth Warren is gonna be bringing a uh, staffer and labor leader from the um, uh, American Federation of Government Employees and uh, Massachusetts AFL-CIO as well. So not surprising for Elizabeth Warren, but good to see representatives of uh, labor there as well. Yeah, labor doesn't get enough attention. That was a good move by her. Exactly. Um, so uh, that's basically some of our thoughts about the State of the Union. Uh, my last thought is um, drink in advance, I guess. We certainly will. Okay, we're <laughs> gonna take a short break. We come back, lots more for you. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un- the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Much of the conversation coming out of Davos earlier this year was absolutely unbearable and seemingly 100% unrelated to the experience of actual people living in poverty or even just not being billionaires (laughs) um, was just terrible. Now there were some standouts though, which we profiled on the show. Uh, We are very lucky now to be joined by one of those standouts uh, right now, Winnie Binyema, uh, the executive director of Oxfam International. Winnie, thank you for joining us on the show. 
Thank you for having me. Uh, very excited to have you here. I, I very much appreciated uh, what you said uh, on one of the panels that you were on uh, at Davos. And uh, I, I wanna talk about that topic because you responded to a remark by the former CFO of Yahoo about the fact that the panel was focusing too much on taxation. And you made an amazing point about why focusing exclusively on unemployment rates sort of misses quite a bit about what's going on. Could, could you talk about that? Yes, every year, John, I go to Davos. I go there to meet billionaires, central bank governors, presidents. They meet there. It's a festival of wealth. They fly in in their private jets, and I come in on my economy seat number 54. <laughs> but I come to give them a very uncomfortable message, which is that there's frightening, widening economic inequality going on. and that. A few people at the top are maximizing, while millions of ordinary people are struggling and sinking. So I bring them a report every year, and that's what I did this time. I told them that this year alone, last year, that the wealth of the billionaires was increasing by $2.5 billion a year a day, and that the wealth of the bottom half of humanity, 3.8 billion people, was decreasing by $500 million daily. And that 26 people alone had as much wealth as the bottom half of humanity, 3.8 billion others. And that that was just not sustainable. So I go there to give them this very uncomfortable message. And that panel you're talking about, I got to answer this Yahoo boss who was shouting out an employment figures being very low in America. And I wanted him to know that he was not counting good jobs. He was counting bad jobs, jobs that were humiliating people that were trapping people in poverty. Yeah, we, we often hear uh, from politicians, but also from the media, there's a focus on these sort of quantifiable numbers. So employment rates, how the stock market is doing, um, they certainly seem to be missing something. When you talk about a more general approach, focusing on economic dignity, that sort of thing, how do you think we should measure how our, uh, how our system is working? You know, John, we at Oxfam, we've been number crunching and putting out a report on widening economic inequality every year. And we've been telling the people in power, governments and business that stop counting the wrong things. They keep counting growth, growth. Growth is some economic figure that counts how much wealth is created in, the, in a country and it doesn't count who gets that wealth, who is benefiting, who gets health, who gets education. Who's living a good life? They don't count the right things. So unemployment figures, employment figures ought to be counting real good jobs, not bad jobs that trap people in poverty. Like the women I meet in America, I come there every year to attend the General Assembly of the United Nations. In the hotels where I stay, I meet there women, black like me, who tell me that this is my first job this morning. I'm going on to do my second and my third today. I'll creep into my house at three o'clock in the morning. I never have breakfast with my children. These are not real jobs. These are jobs without dignity. These are jobs that are trapping these people in poverty, never to improve their lives. So we want minimum wages, like in your country. There are people fighting there for a minimum wage of $15 an hour. That's not impossible. But if you've got a billionaire in office with a billionaire cabinet, this is not a message that will sink. But we have to organize and demand for real good wages, living wages for people, and the right conditions of work for ordinary people. We can't have a few people maximizing at the top while millions of others, hardworking people, are trapped in poverty. And then the top dodge. They don't pay their taxes, so you don't even get health care, education, 
protection for old people and disabled people, for the ordinary people who are working hard for the rich. So they have to pay their fair share of taxes. Taxes must go into people's lives, into their health and education, into infrastructure. And ordinary people must have decent work, work that gives them lives of dignity. So Winnie, uh, Emma here, uh, there was a lot of focus on philanthropy, voluntary philanthropy by the billionaires at Davos. Can you talk about why that's misguided in a sense? Because it seems like that philanthropy is not really helping the growing income inequality, both in the United States and worldwide. You know, when very rich people make a lot of money and decide that they're going to spend some of it on helping poor people, we congratulate them, we say, well done. We don't scoff at it. But that's not what will create sustainable societies that are thriving. It is taxes. It's taxes, taxing, asking rich people to pay their fair share, not extra, but fair share of the profits they make and plowing them back into people that will create the societies that are stable, that are thriving, that give everybody a chance. So nothing against philanthropy. Even Bill Gates, one of the richest men in the world, has said that the first responsibility of a company is to pay their taxes, their fair share of taxes. So this whole business of talking philanthropy, philanthropy as a replacement for taxes is wrong. Philanthropy is good, it's additional, but societies have to be run on taxes because taxes create the economies we need. They pay for a well-educated, healthy workforce, the rule of law, infrastructure, all the things that the rich need for their businesses to thrive. Winnie Bianyema, Executive Director of Oxfam International, thank you so much for joining us on the show, we really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, John. Thank you. We're gonna take a short break. We come back, updates on the family separation crisis. What is the Trump administration saying about it now after this? Welcome back to the show, everyone. We turn now to the family separation crisis. The latest messaging coming out of the Trump administration on the ongoing damage that was done by their completely unnecessary and self-destructive decision to separate families at the border to try to scare migrants away from entering the United States continues with the Trump administration saying that actually fixing the problem, reuniting these families, do you really want that? Would that really be good for anyone? Meaning us. <laughs> Meaning them. <laughs> so Jonathan White, who is in charge of this effort to reunite the kids, says it would destabilize the permanency of their existing home environment. It could be traumatic to the children. It's just an excuse to not put any effort in mm-hmm. and also not have a storyline out there where it's about these families being reunited and then selling their story to the media. They mm-hmm. just want to keep things as is and not put any effort in to rectify a situation that they actively created. Yeah. As has been revealed through leaked documents, they were working on a family separation policy as a deterrence before uh, Kirsten Nielsen said mm-hmm. under oath in front of the, the House, I believe, that um, they were not doing it actively. So, yeah. I mean, they've been working on this throughout the entire administration and don't really want to go back. Yeah, it feels like there'd be some consequences for her having lied under oath like that, but that's just a process crime, so we're not going to worry about that. <laughs> um, now, on top of the the kids would rather stay not with their parents because reuniting them would be traumatic. Mm. And we care about trauma against kids. That's what the Trump administration said. They care about kids, bullied kids they named Joshua kids. Trump. <laughs> yes, if any of these kids from Guatemala have the last name Trump, there's a chance they might get to go to the State of the Union. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not just that it would be traumatic. Uh, the agency also suggested that the reunification would take extraordinary effort, arguing that the administration should simply focus on reuniting children being held in custody, not those released to sponsors. Oh man, it's so, just too hard. It's too much effort. To okay, then don't do it in the first place. If if it being wildly, shockingly immoral wasn't enough of a reason for you to not do it, how about it'll be tough to fix? That's a good reason not to. Why are they treating this like cavalierly? Like, oh, I don't feel like going to the gym today. 
Mm-hmm. It's like that kind of <laughs> seriously. Oh, I've had a long day. It's too much effort. I gotta pack my gym bag. I gotta go to the gym. No, it's like about reuniting families yeah. with their parents. Of course, it would not be traumatic to give them back to their parents. Yeah. It'd be a dream come true. It's 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 this Orwellian kind of BS that's just infuriating. Where mm-hmm. they say the that now rectifying their mistake would be somehow worse than the original mistake or too tough. Yeah. I like your metaphor. I think um, so. To Jonathan White, yeah, I know you don't, don't really want to do it, but just do it. You might find that once you're in the middle of doing it, you like it, you know, and then you want to stay. <laughs> Endorphins, um, baby. Exactly. And uh, by the way, to give you an idea of how tough it would be to do, Deputy Director of HHS Office of Refugee Resettlement Jalen Suolog said in, in a court filing that it could take eight hours to review each of the more than forty-seven thousand cases from the middle of 2017 until the June court order that ended the process. So think about it. It's too much work to spend eight hours to fix some of the damage that you have done to a human being. Eight hours is too much. It's a full work day. You're a, Who can be bothered? You are a public servant. You serve the public. So do that by putting in the hours. That's what you've signed up to do. Mm-hmm. But it, that, that's not the, the role that they see themselves as. They see themselves as destroyers of government bureaucracy, not as public servants, which is a Huge difference in philosophy between the left and the right, the far right, which is embodied by the Trump administration. Exactly. Yeah, and this is, look, we've had a number of different updates over the course of the past month or two. Apparently, the number of kids that were separated was far higher than we were initially led to believe. As you pointed out, the plans were drawn up far earlier than we were led to believe. This entire thing has been, I think it should go on a list of at least in the past 50, 100 years, what are the biggest totally needless tragedies the United United States government has willingly created out of whole cloth? And a reminder as we launch this next election, of the price of Donald Trump continuing to be present, just in case you had forgotten. Okay, with that, let's turn to a slightly more positive news. Very soon, new representative Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, as well as a sponsor in the Senate, will be putting forward their Green New Deal legislation. And we don't yet have the bill, we don't know exactly what's in it, but some details have been released. And so um, we have some quotes from uh, Representative Ocasio-Cortez, as well as details on the plan. She said in a letter, next week we plan to release a resolution that outlines the scope and scale of the Green New Deal. In it, we call for a national, social, industrial, and economic mobilization at a scale not seen since World War II. So this is the sort of messaging around the issue that she has used for months now. I think it is not only factually like responsible, I also think that it is important, we need to get people ready for the severity of this problem. Not only in the challenge that we face in fixing it, but also as with you know, dealing with World War II, getting to the moon, fixing the hole in the ozone layer, ending acid rain, these gigantic problems also came thankfully with a lot of benefits once we were done. So first of all, on the messaging, I know she has been mocked for comparing it to World War II. What do you think about that tact? Yeah, Fox News headline, Ocasio-Cortez wants to create World War II. I mean, so not, it's pretty <laughs> close, or World War III or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, the New Deal framing is the strongest of the, the way that uh, this topic is being talked about in terms of messaging, because the New Deal was an expansion of government government projects, of government services, of the social safety net. Um, And it allowed for economic or created economic opportunity for people when there was this massive uh, depression. Mm -hmm. And this is a similar thing where you're remaking the economy in the vision that uh, would provide for a more sustainable future. And uh, that requires government intervention. So it calls back to the New Deal, which Americans see positively, FDR Mm -hmm. is a popular president, um, and I like that. So I think that the reason that it's gaining so much steam and that 80% of registered voters see it so favorably and believe that it would be a good idea is because it harkens back to that uh, time where government worked better for the people than it almost ever has in the entire country, and it did its job, and that was by basically expanding uh, the economy through government in, uh, intervention. Yeah, yeah, at a time before industry had you know personally owned all of the politicians. Right. Um, yeah, by the way, I, I hesitate to even put this out there. Maybe it's already a thing. Um, but as you point out, the Green New Deal is a great framing. How have the Republicans not started calling it the Red New Deal yet? 
Uh, I don't want to put that out there. Why I don't want would them to you start do doing that? that? But I am curious. <laughs> they probably have. That's probably a Jesse Waters special. Anyway, uh, some details on what will be included. Goals laid out in the letter include reaching net zero greenhouse gas emissions, quote, through a fair and just transition for all communities and workers, creating millions of, quote, good high wage jobs, while ensuring prosperity and economic security for all, and investment in infrastructure and industry. I look forward to a successful infrastructure week. We haven't had one yet in the past couple of years. Uh, the resolution will also call for clean air and water, climate resiliency, healthy food, access to nature, and quote, a sustainable environment for all generations to come. Lastly, the Green New Deal will quote, promote justice and equity by preventing current and repairing historic oppression to frontline and vulnerable communities. So look, we've we've covered the details many times, including with um, environmental activists. We've talked about it with uh, James Cromwell and you know, representative of the, um, the Sunrise Movement. But this is a reminder that it is not just about like, hey, we should have more solar energy. It is much broader than that, and it needs to be to accomplish its task. Yeah, it's about economic uh, or environmental racism, excuse me, which doesn't get talked mm -hmm. about enough, where the communities that are impacted the most are often the poorest, often minorities. And that's why you Republicans don't really care, because they can elevate their home on Miami Beach and, mm -hmm. and move or sell their property. But it's going to affect people with the least amount of economic resources the most. Yeah. Uh, and that's what the Green New Deal's set to address. Yeah. Uh, just really fast, I want to mention because uh, many will try to imply that she is sort of a wild eyed idealist on trying to push this, but it's already endorsed by the Sierra Club and Tom Stair's uh, Next Gen America, as well as the, the SEIU, the Working Families Party, People's Action, Center for Popular Democracy, Justice First, Green for All, 350.org, Credo Action, as well as the Sunrise Movement and the Justice Democrats. And uh, co sponsors already include, uh, as you're seeing there, uh, multiple representatives. Um, also, um, Senator Ed Markey is going to put for the Senate version. And you also have some of the people who have already announced they're gonna be running for the presidency. You have Harris and I believe Booker and Gillibrand, as well as- And Warren. Yeah, yeah, exactly, have said that they support it. The reason I was starting with them is they have said that they will support it and we will see what that actually means in practice. <laughs> and then you have others who support it. Right. <laughs> so right. let's just clarify that. We will see, we'll continue to check up. We do have to take a short break, we come back. Awesome guests gonna join us after this. For the first time in my living memory, it is actually tough, briefly, to be a billionaire. People are questioning whether you running for president is a good thing. They're suggesting your taxes might need to go up to where they were historically in America for literally decades. How dare they? Uh, joining us now, an expert on billionaires, their effect on policy, and elite philanthropy, author of Winners Take All, Anand Giridardas. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, very glad to have you here and very excited to talk to you about all of these topics. Um, so you have written, as we just said, uh, winners take all, where you talk about sort of the stated goal of elite philanthropy and the ability of billionaires to fix the world's problems versus what actually ends up happening. So I, I have a question for you, can billionaires save us all? Uh, they're not gonna save us, but they're gonna use the idea of saving us. Mm -hmm. Screw us in new ways that we haven't, and even they haven't yet dreamed of. Awesome. How, what are some of those ways? <laughs> you know, I mean, you all do such a great job in the show of talking about the over-influence of billionaires. And the way I tell the story in the book is um, that, that the kind of change the world rhetoric that we often hear from billionaires, whether that means trying to run for president like Howard Schultz and Mike Bloomberg and even Donald Trump, or big philanthropy, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, um, the Sackler family, uh, or you know all these other manifestations, it kind of happened in two phases. First, starting in the 70s, you had this kind of billionaire plutocratic takeover of American life through a war on government, low taxes, low regulation, let them prosper. That was a very successful revolution, as you all know, but it was something of a callous revolution um, that was somewhat obvious after a while. It was pretty obvious that rich people didn't want to pay taxes because they want to be rich. And it was pretty obvious that chemical companies didn't want to be regulated because they wanted to dump sludge into rivers. And I think that on its own, that posture had a limited shelf life. As you started to see problems multiply because the government was doing less and all these rich people were getting away with murder, they reinvented themselves in more recent years and started to say, yeah, we do live in a time of inequality. It's so terrible, so terrible. <laughs> yeah, you know, a lot of developing countries, there's so many poor people. Oh, my heart, my heart aches. Um, you know, women got it. Yeah, we got, I may grope them at work, but we have to empower them also. 
You know, that's, that's how this kind of plutocratic posture developed. And instead of ignoring social problems, the billionaire class brilliantly got out in front of them, uh, decided that they were going to lead the bandwagon of changing the world. We're going we're to change the world. Mark Zuckerberg's changing the world. Goldman Sachs is changing the world. Exxon Mobil is fighting for a clean environment. Coca-Cola is trying to clean your water. Um, Sheryl Sandberg, who has done so much to make sure that American women don't live uh, you know, in, in a free country, uh, was doing lean in and telling women that she was empowering them by convincing them that patriarchy is a posture problem. Uh, this is one of the most remarkable takeovers. And I think it's less well known than the first thing. We all know about the anti-tax deregulation mm -hmm. stuff. But when billionaires took over the idea of making change, when they took over the idea of making the world better, it was, this is the, 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 the riggiest part of the rigging. Uh, because they not only stole the future from a generation of Americans, they stole the idea of what you do when the future is stolen from mm -hmm. you. So, uh, hi, Emma here. Um, I just wanted to ask you, because you mentioned Sheryl Sandberg, about, I think there's been sort of a backlash since Lean In came out, what was it, seven or five years ago, where it was initially embraced, but kind of has been rejected as this white feminist, uh, pro-billionaire, pro-elite class kind of uh, basically fluff piece book. And I know, that I know there's been some backlash uh, do you see that as part and parcel of the same backlash that uh, Howard Schultz is getting, where people are kind of realizing that billionaires aren't going to voluntarily uh, do the right thing and that they can't, are dipping their toes into politics and into areas of power that they don't necessarily belong in? Yes, and I think it's very smart of you to connect those things because lean in is absurd enough on its own that it's possible to look at it as its own problem, but it's not. Exactly as you say, Look, I actually think billionaires are not so different from you and me uh, in the following way. They have interests and they don't like to see those interests trampled, right? I don't have four houses, I have one house, but I wouldn't like someone to take it away. You know, I, I, I don't want someone, uh, you know, interfering with my, my ability to do the things that I value doing. The difference is you and I don't do a lot of stuff that is harming lots of people. You and I are not exploiting lots of people. Unfortunately, when billionaires, whether it's getting involved in philanthropy, whether it's getting involved in running for office, they can't help but rep themselves. They can't help but use public service or philanthropy or whatever noble sounding thing as a platform to continue to articulate and defend their own interests. So when Howard Schultz gets into the presidential you know, sort of ring and he can't wait 24 hours to call the ideas emanating from two offices of two women of color in Congress, Un-American, mm -hmm. right? Why? Because they want health care for everybody, which is basically the law of the land in most Western countries, and because they want to tax people like him a little more. These people are unable to check their interests at the door, and they have a lot of interests that are counter to all of our interests. In terms of lean in, you have the same phenomenon. Lean in is an, exa an example of change light on every issue, education, health. You could have real change that costs quite a bit of money because of what change is and means. And the winners aren't stupid enough to just oppose that anymore. They now get in front of it by offering a kind of light facsimile of change as a counteroffer. So don't do maternity leave because that would be really expensive or don't crack down on sexual harassment. That would require all kinds of expensive regulation and compliance. But let's still lean in because if women just raise their hand more, maybe the problem will go away on, on education. Don't do equal and adequately funded public schools for everybody. Because again, that would actually make the schools in Greenwich less good. And why would I want to do that? Uh, <laughs> But, but, it, but if you tell, you know, if you, if you put your name on a charter school, then you can go to cocktail parties and, and tell your friends you got some minority kids into Yale and everybody wins. Anand Gerdardos, uh, there's a million follow-ups I'd like to ask. I wish we had much more time. Um, hopefully you can come back on the show soon and we can uh, talk about some of the related issues. Doing what you do, I'm happy to come back anytime. Thank you very much. Uh, the book is Winners Take All. Everyone uh, check it out. Uh, awesome and extremely timely uh, writing there. So thank you. Thank you. We're gonna take a one last short break and then we launch into Meanwhile In, what is going on around the world and throughout time after this. Don't get distracted by the State of the Union. There is so much news going on there outside of America, which we like to profile in a segment we call Meanwhile In. Meanwhile, 
actually in America, but 500 years ago, American colonists initially were so evil, they literally changed the climate. So European settlers killed 56 million indigenous people over about 100 years in South, Central and North America, causing large swaths of farmland to be abandoned and reforested, according to researchers at University College London. The increase in trees and vegetation as a result of this genocide across an area the size of France resulted in a massive decrease in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Carbon levels changed enough to cool the earth by 1610, wow. Yeah, I mean, we just can't help but changing the climate, us white people coming to America and doing awful, awful stuff. Yeah, it was just like to, to, have, it be, to have it be that strong, that, that big of an effect. And 56 million is a staggering figure. And exactly. I, it's like, I don't understand why we don't talk about it every day, mm -hmm. that we just are a country founded on genocide. But, you know, yeah. I guess that doesn't go well with your Cheerios in the morning. But. That's true. I mean, lately we briefly get to talk about the topic. Uh, when Columbus Day comes around. Yes. And a bunch of concerned people around the country are like, hey, by the way, um, he literally raped kids and murdered people and tortured them and chopped them to bits and enslaved an entire people. Yeah, but they Maybe want, people we don't want celebrate. their day off. People want their day off. They you should can just have change your day it. off. I know. <laughs> just change it to Oprah Day. Change it to Ocasio Cortez Day. We'd celebrate. That'd be cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, make election day. Let's have an election day. Yeah. And you know what? We'll have it every year. Three out of four, two out of four, you won't even have an election. You can just chill, let's do that. Yeah, and so many people will go inside that will change the atmosphere and that the <laughs> CO2 will go down. Exactly, it all comes around. I don't really know how science works. No, it doesn't. So we're gonna try to figure out science, but uh, meanwhile in. <music> meanwhile, in the world's oceans, we're gonna run out of clams. Uh, for the past million years, the world's oceans have existed in a slightly alkaline state with an average pH of 8.2, I don't know why I'm telling you that, I'm sure that you know. <laughs> now, with carbon emissions escalating, there's more CO2 in the world's atmosphere. This dissolves into the oceans, altering the chemistry of the seawater by lowering the pH and making it more acidic, up to 30% more in the past 200 years. Which again, like with the climate from genocide, to change the entire world's oceans that much takes a lot of effort. So pat yourself on the back, uh, humanity. Um, but unfortunately, it has a bad result. Uh, shellfish are creatures which produce calcium carbonate shells and skeletons, such as mussels, oysters, and corals, um, or cockles and clams, as Arya Stark says. Uh, they create their productive shell structures through a process known as biomineralization, producing hard minerals such as calcium carbonate by filtering calcium and carbonate from the water. If the amount of carbonate available in the oceans is reduced by acidification, it limits the ability of these creatures to create shells. So it took us a while to get there through science land, but we got to where it matters. You're gonna not be able to eat these in the future. And so you can add that to coffee and chocolate and pork and all the other products that climate change is going to eliminate. So eat it while you can, I guess. Well, the Bible already says that you shouldn't be eating shellfish and that you shouldn't be cutting your hair and you shouldn't be wearing a cotton blend. So if you're doing any of that, you're already going to hell. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> uh, so climate change brought to you by God. Uh, meanwhile in. This is sort of the sad one. Meanwhile, in Yemen, our weapons are once again ending up in the wrong hands, rather than the hands they were intended to land in, which I would argue were still the wrong ones. But this is a different wrong set of hands. Uh, Saudi Arabia and its coalition partners have transferred American made weapons to Al Qaeda linked fighters, hard lane Salafi militias, and other factions waging war in Yemen in violation of their agreements with the United States. The weapons have also made their way into the hands of Iranian backed rebels battling the coalition for control of the country, exposing some of America's sensitive military technology to Tehran and potentially endangering the lives of US troops in other conflict zones. Are, are weapons going to Al Qaeda? Where and where have we seen this before? Mm -hmm. When has it ever gone wrong? No. You know, I mean, that's. Reagan now exactly. created this entire situation, that's where we are. It's insane that our weapons manufacturers have this much of a pull, because mm -hmm. it doesn't matter where these weapons go, they'll, they, know, they probably know it's gonna go into the wrong hands, but mm -hmm. it's all about making the sale. So yeah. Trump even himself said it, so. Exactly, yeah, I mean this news coming out, like if you work for Boeing or Lockheed Martin or anything, like what do you care? Yeah, and helping our, our profit margins. Yeah, bad for us though. Yeah. Uh, thank you for joining us, by the way. 
Emma, always Great. good to have you here, and thank especially you, to have you in person. Yes, thank you so much for having me, and excited to be on again later this week. Exactly, yeah. uh, twice in one week, how amazing is that? Thank you to everyone who has been watching the show. If you haven't already rated, rate us on iTunes, leave a review, five stars would be great. You can write a review as well, we might read it on the show. Facebook.com slash The Damage Report TYT. Thank you again, we'll see you tomorrow to do a breakdown of the State of the Union. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.